Our next program will be another live streaming show with wood turning artist Mike Mahoney from the USA. Mike will demonstrate for us how to make a platter and a burial urn. Hey everybody, um, I'm Mike Mahoney, live from uh, rural Northern California. Thanks for having me here at uh, Wood Roll Day. Um, little change of plans, I, uh, I am gonna make a, I'm gonna show you how I make a quarter sawn white oak platter uh, today. But uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, talk about walnut and uh, uh, since most woodworkers are very familiar with the, with the wood walnut, and I want to talk about uh, our, as woodworkers, relationship to walnut. Um, and uh, coming from uh, an American perspective, uh, we certainly, I certainly have a perspective on walnut that would be different from people from all over the world. Um, there are, there's only a couple dozen varieties of walnuts uh, in the world. And in, in North America, there are four major varieties that woodworkers are using. And also, of course, uh, uh, we're using the nuts for food as well. So it's a very valuable tree, not only for its food source, but uh, for its beautiful wood. And, uh, and I'm lucky uh, where I live, I am uh, encased in walnut wood everywhere you go here in Northern California and even Central California is covered with uh, orchard trees. Now, we also are endowed with a, a native walnut here called Claro walnut, which is, I, I'm gonna, going to kind of get a little scientific here and, and, and use the scientific terms because it's, it's one way that we know we're talking about the same walnut tree. Um, so the native California, Northern California walnut is called Juglans heinzii. Um, Juglans is the, the walnut and Hinzii is the species. You can say Heinzii, Hinzii. Um, uh, Heinz or, was a botanist uh, who I think came from Scotland and, and first noticed the native California walnut tree. And now that uh, is a, the, the tree that grows here in rural Northern California is different than say the walnut that grow east of California, those would be Juglans nigra. Uh, and actually, um, I'm sitting here telling you a story uh, about the walnut trees that I've already got it queued up here on my laptop. Uh, let, let's go right to, uh, I'll share my screen with you and just kind of show you uh, the story I was going to present. Um, so I say my relationship with the walnut wood and, and certainly, um, as a production wood turner, I've always had to source wood that was local to where I lived and, and, uh, there was, and abundant, of course. Um, just like probably many other woodworkers, it's always a good choice to use the, the timber that is closest to you and also is uh, uh, responsibly uh, removed. Um, so here's my story about walnut wood. Um, so Let's go to page two here, and I'll talk about the uh, what juglans means. And it's kind of funny because uh, Ju is short for the the word Jupiter, which would mean as in God, and glans meaning acorn. Uh, so junipers, acorns. Uh, I had to clean that up a bit, and uh, for us English speakers out there, um, the actual term for glans is nuts. And I didn't think it was appropriate to say God's nuts because it, it sounded kind of silly. Anyway, uh, bear with me for the, the pun. Uh, so there are, like I said, there's two dozen, more than two dozen species of, of walnut. Now, also I've done some research uh, and, and here in North America, probably like this in Russia and China and Japan, um, we have guidebooks for all the species of trees that grow here. And uh, they're very scientific and very specific. Uh, I, it's been very difficult for me to find scientific books uh, uh, on, on any trees in particular from Chinese, China or Russia or Japan. And for the main reason is I speak English and I don't, I don't read in those languages. So I suspect there's some good um, uh, scholarship on, on this subject in those languages. And I just don't know them. But I'm going to give you an American perspective on, on this whole subject. And um, I'll kind of uh, 
think that this has already happened in, in other parts of the world because we're a fairly young country and uh, I can't imagine that somewhere in China or Russia or Japan that uh, some of these things didn't happen before we knew about it anyway. So um, commercially here in North America, there's four valuable uh, wood walnuts or juglets, and that would be the English walnut, uh, be, which is uh, not only very uh, a beautiful commercial wood, but it, of course it's the, the, the best nut um, that is available on the market. Um, we eat the English walnut uh, because of the ease of it cracking open and processing and of course uh, its taste and its very large size because the native walnuts that grow in North America are very small and they're, they're hard as a rock and they're very hard to get open. Uh, the, the nut is very tasty but again uh, not as commercially successful as the uh, English walnut. Now we're going to use the term English walnut because that's how it, as an American, we would perceive this walnut. It is not English at all. Uh, the English walnut comes, uh, I think uh, I, I go into that, but it usually comes from Persia or Asia Minor, as we say here in North America. Um, then we have the Juglans Niger, which is our black walnut. Um, and then we have a cross um, called, uh, we'll call it paradox wood, uh, it's a cross between the English walnut and the California walnut, which produced a tree called paradox or bastone uh, is a Portuguese term for the wood. And I'll give you examples of what those woods look like. And they're all very important woods to a woodworker like myself, because uh, uh, I, I do have my favorites, of course, uh, but um, they are very valuable as woodworkers. So let's go to page three here. Uh, breaking down the uh, Juglans regia, which is English walnut, originally grew in the old world from southeastern Europe to Japan with the most uh, densities of this species in Persia, which would be the Iran area. Uh, Juglans Niagara, black walnut, grows southeastern Canada, south to southern states to the eastern slopes of the Sierra Nevadas. Juglans Hinzii, uh, our native California walnut, where I'm speaking to you from, uh, which is uh, my favorite because naturally I live here and it's uh, relatively abundant. Uh, it grows in the fertile valleys here in Northern California. Uh, Juglans hinzii, bred with Juglans regia, is called paradox, uh, which I just mentioned, <clears throat> which was cross-pollinated by a botanist named Luther Burbank. Um, and this was in the... Uh, 1890s, I would believe. I, I may have something written down here about it. Luther Burbank was a, a very special man and a botanist who uh, basically created a California agriculture. Um, so he, um, he, we had the English walnut tree here at the, in those days, but it didn't grow well in our soils and it would die off fairly young. Um, so he cross-pollinated with the California walnut. And when he, the offspring of that tree created this wood he called paradox. And the reason he called it paradox was um, the tree that he grew in, in a matter of eight years grew to 24 inches in diameter. So a very large tree in a very short time. So the tree was very vigorous. The offspring of that cross was very um, vigorous. And of course, when you cross two like species like that, the typically sterile trees so they don't produce offspring themselves uh, every once in a while they will produce a nut but anyway the paradox was the faster this tree grew the denser the timber it was so uh, he had the ability obviously to, to determine densities in wood and he determined that his cross produced a very dense walnut tree which the paradox was that the faster it grew the harder the timber it was so kind of interesting in that. Uh, remember the name Luther Burbank, and, and if you're interested uh, about him, um, check him out, a very interesting character. Uh, he was from the Eastern parts of the United States, moved to California with some brothers. Uh, he was a botanist and uh, did some pretty interesting things with plants and trees. And, um, and also for you folks in the East, uh, China, Russia, if there was anything like that going on, uh, in, in that walnut species, I would love to know about it because uh, that information is hard to come by here for me. Um, 
this is kind of a typical thought here. You can see the black walnut tree here. Um, typical walnuts are pinnate leaves, very thin, but the English walnut has a much larger lobe to it. And all the Persian walnuts definitely have those larger lobes. So just something to think about. There are variations of all these, of course. Um, so here in Northern California, um, uh, it's a big agricultural product. I, I would venture to say we probably are growing 75% 75, 75 of the world's walnut trees. Um, not a great picture here. Um, the, the picture on the left shows uh, what walnut trees used to grow like about uh, starting 100 years ago. Uh, they were spaced out about 40 feet apart and they were not watered. These, these trees were um, dry farmed. Um, and so they had to space the trees out because they had to compete for water. And then the, the, the orchard on the right side of the picture here is a more modern orchard. These trees are 15 feet apart and of course they're watered. And uh, if you're in the business of growing walnuts, you would never dry farm them any longer in California because you would never uh, be able to compete in business. Um, this is kind of a short-sighted, uh, probably in my mind, not a sustainable way to farm, but it's happening now and that's just the way it is. Uh, these trees are much closely compacted together and they, um, of course, they're watered and they're all mechanically pruned, mechanically harvested. So humans don't do a whole lot in these orchards. Uh, they're, they're all done uh, all mechanically. It's pretty interesting. Um, I'll, I'll get closer, we'll get closer images of these pictures. Um, so that the tree on the left here is the cross, the, the, the paradox tree that we talked about that Luther Burbank uh, bred. Um, if you notice, let's just say you're in rural Northern California, or just notice a, a, some walnut trees in your area that grow that are grown for fruit. Um, notice the difference in the trunk wood as compared to the limb wood. Um, those two areas have been grafted. The one here on the top, that's our, that's our Persian or English walnut. The, the trunk wood is your California or Claro walnut. Um, so these two trees have been grafted together because the English walnut, of course, would not grow well in our soil. So they use the native grower uh, to plant and then the, the graft to produce the nuts. The, the tree here on the left, um, you can you notice that the um, the trunk is a little bit thicker than the grafted area there, and that's because that the the root stock of this tree is the paradox. It's the much more vigorous grower that Luther Burbank produced, um, and also notice the relative resemblance of the two that are connected there. Um, they almost have similar barks, and that's because. Um, uh, they're more closely bred than the California wall to the English wall there on the side. All right, so very good. Um, I'm gonna kind of look at, let, let's go look to our, another page here. Um, and that, just to give you an idea how big these paradox trees, and I, I must tell you that the uh, paradox, Luther Burbank's idea for the paradox tree in the start was for a shade tree. He thought it would make uh, for a great shade tree because walnut trees are beautiful um, trees just as they are. But the, the biggest drawback to them is they produce a nut and lots of nuts. And so those nuts uh, are hard to walk around. So if you planted a walnut tree next to your house, you, re you would probably re regret it. So he thought the paradox tree would be fantastic because it didn't produce a nut and it would make great shade and do it really fast. And this is this is a, a photo of a friend of mine who came over to show me uh, this uh, paradox tree that grows in our area. This tree is only about 100 years old. You can imagine the, the incredible uh, immensity of this tree in such a short time. It grew really fast. Um, now, uh, this is some other images here. Um, if you recall the images of the trees, actually, I'll just put it back on the screen. The trees there on the right, those trees are going to be ripped out about every 25 years and replanted. And so they're never gonna get very massive. And so guys and people like me will not 
no longer be able to use this wood for their craft because of modern technology. Um, and that's unfortunate. Uh, you know, I'll be long gone before that's completely out of uh, the realm, but maybe uh, we'll run out of water and we'll have to go back to the ways, the old ways as well. Um, but I wanted to uh, come and show you some images of the people I get my wood from. Um, I source most of my wood turning wood for, uh, from these orchards. And these orchards are typically 75, 85 years old. Um, the tree here on the left, that's the root ball of one of those walnut trees. Uh, that right there is a, about a 6,500 pound burl, a veneer quality burl. And that's my friend Skyler Phelps there. He's an orchard removal man. And uh, I meet guys like him and uh, he sells me uh, literally 100,000 pounds of, of English walnut trees, just like that. And I'm interested in the English walnut, the straight grain version here, than I am the burl. Now the burl, of course, is beautiful wood. Um, and I, I will accept some in, in time, but the price of it is a little bit too much for the product that I make. I like it, but I don't use a lot of it. And it's not that I make, I make items for utility and a lot of this walnut has relatively, uh, they have voids in it and it doesn't make good utility salad bowls that I would be making. So these English walnut logs here on the, the right side would be exactly what I'd want. And most of these English walnut logs have a, a tight curl in them. So they're, they're very attractive wood. And I'll, I'll show us examples of these as we go. Uh, actually, this, this, this picture here is a, I'm going to show you the four varieties of wood right now. This is a Claral Walnut Bowl. This is a typical uh, piece of production work of mine. You can see the kind of marbled figure that the Claro has. It's a little bit brighter than the Black Walnut. Um, and not only that, the the differences in color in the grain tend to stay over time. They don't oxidize with ultraviolet light like the black walnut. Black walnuts tend to just get blacker and blacker. Um, here's, a, here's an image of a black walnut right there. So you can see just the difference. There's more copper colors in the claro walnut as compared to more coffee colors in the black walnut. And this piece will just get darker and darker with age. Um, and, and the, the, the black walnut for sure is a little bit more dicey to work with in the sense of um, it's, uh, it's more toxic to most craftspeople. It tends to uh, irritate the nose and, and cause allergies as compared to the claro walnut. It's not nearly as uh, obnoxious. Uh, here's an image of uh, Bastone which is also that paradox wood that we talked about. And it's a much lighter. So this is a cross between the English and the California walnut. And it's got much lighter colors. And again, you can see the broad annual rings in that. And then this is an image of an English walnut together by itself. Um, this is pure English walnut or Persian walnut. Uh, I, I think this is the, the most beautiful of all the walnuts uh, and easiest to work. It's a fabulous wood to work. That is not obnoxious on the nose or anything like that. It's got this beautiful ribbon. And there's, there's many species of this variety that grow here as well. And uh, they provide you know, different size nuts and things like that. So I'll just give you some idea. And then we'll go to another image of some flat work. Um, this, this piece here, on the left, that's English walnut. Here's your paradox walnut there, much more copper color. Um, the, this is your black walnut, a much deeper, darker brown black color. And then your Clara walnut here, not a good image of that. Um, it's, it's a little lighter and more defined than your black walnut. So that's kind of what I know about black walnut for, or walnuts in general. And I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great, um, study, uh, if you're interested in walnuts at all, at all uh, kind of do some research on that. Um, a, a, an interesting historical fact in North America in 19 or 1869, the U.S. completed a transcontinental railroad system. Early entrepreneur, 
entrepreneurs learned that they could cut down the native California walnut and ship that lumber to furniture makers back east because um, they found that the Claro walnut, uh, the, the furniture makers out there liked it, uh, its workability is better and its color. Uh, but just like the gold here in Gold Rush country where I live, the native walnut ran out because it was harvested too much and is now regarded as an endangered species and, and, it, and it still is to this day. And the reason for that, of course, is most of its native land was, is farmland and also the, the deer depredation <clears throat> uh, or the deer predation, I'm sorry. Uh, deer here now um, are very numerous where, when they weren't here in the 1850s. And it's not that they weren't here, that they just weren't here in the numbers that they are here now. Um, if, you, if a deer was unfortunate to live in the 1850s, it was hunted regularly. Nowadays, uh, us humans tend to give them a pass unless they're eating our bushes. <laughs> anyway, so that's, uh, that's my story on walnut. I'm gonna go to our, uh, our next program and this will give me a chance to, um, to see our, uh, uh, our little chat area here that I need to see to see if anybody has any questions. Let's see here if I can do that. And then I'll get on to my next program. Let's see, I don't think I have, I chose here that I don't have any questions. So I guess I'm okay with that. Um, so if you have questions, by, by all means ask them because uh, this is the time to do it. Uh, I'm going to go to my next little program here and we'll talk about making platters. Okay, so again, I'm gonna, uh, let's go to my remote demo file and then, so, Let's talk about oaks instead of walnuts this time. Uh, but this leads into my platter demo. So <clears throat> I'm gonna say, well, oak is not my favorite wood, but it's, it's an incredible wood for humans historically. Um, it was probably one of the first uh, woods humans worked with. Uh, because of its medullary ray, its ability to be split. Um, now, uh, there's, um, there's 450 varieties of oak species uh, in the world. And uh, probably, and I could be, I could stand corrected, uh, the oak is probably the most successful tree in, in the world uh, for its ability to grow in different locations. It grows in semi-alpine conditions into desert conditions. So it grows all through that spectrum. Um, now, having said that there's 450 varieties of oak, um, <clears throat> they all fall into two categories, white oaks and red oaks. Now I know at least here in North America, we, we have probably 75 different oak species and we have different names for all of them. I could just name you some that right out my door here, blue oak, valley oak, huckleberry oak, black oak, scrub oak, all these common names for these oak trees. Well, and I, as I mentioned, oaks fall into two categories, white oaks and red oaks. And all those common names fall into those two categories. And why is that important? Well, it may not be uh, for a lot of reasons, but for a guy, like me who makes items of utility, I'm looking for the use of white oaks in particular because white oaks don't transpire moisture. Um, red oaks tend to, well, the, the, just the difference, uh, our wine barrels, uh, all the wine barrels that you see that are made in the world are made out of white oaks. Because again, if you put wine in a red, boat, red oak barrel, it's gonna end up on the floor and you wouldn't want that. Um, same goes for a person like me who's making platters and bowls. You don't want your food oils, uh, your vinegar or anything to end up on the table below. So we use white oak so uh, it won't transpire that moisture. Um, but how do we know the difference? Well, this is very simple, simple way to think about it. Uh, all white oaks have a soft lobe on the ends of their leaves. The red oaks have a point. And I'll show you, I'm gonna cue up my video now. The red oaks have a point. I'll show you what a red oak leaf. Now there's so many different varieties of leaves. 
uh, but just remember the red oaks have points and the white oaks have soft lobes. So there's your red oak leaf, sharp points. So that's, that's how you know. So your neighbor cuts down an oak tree or an oak tree, you have access to an oak tree in the forest. You wanna know if it's a white or a red, look for the points or the lobes. So that, that's how you would know. So you're gonna watch me here dissecting a, a, a really large oak tree here in a second. But first, let me show you the end grains of, of a white oak tree. And really visually, <clears throat> it's really hard to tell the difference between a white and a red oak just from the wood alone. You have to see the leaves a lot. Uh, so it's good to know before you, you make an object out of it. But my concerns for making a platter means I want to make all my platter stock out of quarter sawn bits of wood. Um, I just don't want randomly cut boards to make platters because I want my platters to last forever. Uh, so I want them to lay flat and by quarter sawing them, that enables me to make good product that people will use and that will last. Uh, a lifetime if I make them correctly. So here's a, uh, we'll just look at this end grain. This is a valley oak that grows here in my area. Um, so I've got this pit crack right here and you can see a medullary ray, this dark line coming out of the center. That's the medullary ray. We wanna run our saw right through that medullary ray. And if you look at the side of what you sawed there, you get this beautiful flecking pattern. And that's, that's our quarter sawn look. So for a platter here, let's just say this is a, a 36 inch diameter log, which would be a very large log. Um, I'm gonna take a two inch piece of wood right out of there. And I'm, again, I'm cutting with the medullary ray. And then I, I'll make another cut here. I'm following the medullary ray. Another cut here, following the medullary ray. Another cut here following the medullary ray again. Those are my four platter blanks out of this uh, log. Now, you might say that, that that's a big waste of wood, but no, there's still more quarters to come out of this uh, particular log. I'll make another cut here. Uh, as long as I'm following the medullary ray, I'm making boards out of these quarter signs. So those are the boards or the the blanks that I'll be using to make butcher block tops, uh, uh, platter blanks, plates, trays, those sorts of things. And I'll get a beautiful flecking pattern uh, out of this wood. Now notice what's also happening in these boards. The annual rings are going through the boards in straight lines. That's why our wood isn't gonna cut or warp because of that aspect of, of, the, of the grain. Now, if you took a board out of here, for instance, let's just erase this. Let's take a board out of here. Well, now you've got annual rings and long arcs in the board. Now, as this piece gets used over time, it's gonna absorb moisture, it's going to exhaust it. And this board is going to cup and warp. Therefore, your product is not gonna stay level on the table, um, and therefore it's not gonna be as valuable. And that's, that's important to me, someone who wants to make work, uh, quality work. Um, I think about this a lot and I wanna make sure I make good, good work out of good boards. So that's the quarter sawn idea. Also kind of known as rift cutting, uh, but we won't get into the technicalities and the nomenclature of all the, the other things here. <clears throat> Let me show you me, uh, um, this is a, about a, an eight foot diameter tree that fell down in my neighborhood. White oak is going to make great utility pieces. I'm going to speed this up a bit. You don't want to watch me saw this whole thing here. But I'm out doing this in the winter time. There, I'm pointing at the medullary ray. Let's draw it. So just to overemphasize, that's where I want to draw my saw through that medullary ray. There I am cutting up more. These are all two inch slabs. And then I'm gonna bring the, all these back to my shop and you'll see that here in a second. There's the medullary ray again. That's the beauty of oak. It has a very strong medullary ray. Other trees like sycamore or pecan 
They also have strong medullary rays. You can't see the rays in a lot of other species. But here I am, I'm cutting through that medullary ray and we'll, we'll stop here so we can see it. There you go. That beautiful flecking or tiger stripe is uh, cutting through that medullary ray. So oak uh, is not a fantastic beauty uh, as, as woods are concerned, but when you quarter saw it, voila, you've got a fabulous exotic piece of wood right there that grows in most parts of the world. So let's, let's go further and show you how I make a platter blank, just to kind of talk about the process. I take a little template, I put a nail in the top there, cut a circle, very simple on my bandsaw. Then I'm going to use a wood screw that I work outdoors, by the way, this is my shop. There's a wood screw, I drilled a hole right there. Now this, this wood was freshly down. It, it, I cut it like a week after it fell. You'll see the moisture coming off of my gouge here as we go. I'm not gonna get real technical about the grinds or anything I, that I'd use. Um, this is just a, a hefty 5 8 inch bowl gouge that really absorbs vibration. Since I do hundreds of these at a time, I'm really uh, conscious of the tool use and the, the, the vibration and all that that comes off the, the wood. Here I'm cutting the underside of the platter blank here. Now, I really, again, talking about the grain orientation, the quarter sawn bits and all that, I'm also thinking about the ergodynamics of the piece, the base diameter, the thickness, all those things, uh, and how that... It, it, it equates to its use in its, in its life. Um, platters have about a 50% base. So if this is a 16, dia 16 inch diameter piece, um, I want an eight inch base when it's finished. This is just a rough version. This is all really wet. So I'm oversizing everything because I'm gonna cut it down smaller when this piece dries. Now I'm gonna point out, look what my gouge is doing right there. Um, this is very important when uh, woodworkers need to dry their own wood. And I air dry all my wood. I don't use a kiln or anything. I'm never in a hurry. I, I'm always way ahead of the game. I always have hundreds, if not thousands of, of pieces in storage so I can have for future use. Um, but as I dry the wood, my gouge is softening the edges there. I don't leave these in right angles because those right angles are tension areas and they tend to dry faster and they crack. So I soften the edge. That's, that's kind of the key to making these dry without crack. Because if they crack, I throw them away because I don't want cracks in my work because wood doesn't keep, or glue doesn't keep it together. You could butterfly it, that would be okay. I just don't have the time to do that. Um, so something to think about. Uh, and I do that with all my bowls, everything. I always soften the edges um, to, for the drying process. And then I'm hollowing out the interior of the platter blank here. You can see the water coming off my gouge. I'm leaving this thing about... Uh, half inch thick, three quarters of an inch thick. Um, and then they'll, they'll sit in the drying room uh, in a cool dark place for about 120 days and white oak really dries easy and dries fast. Let me speed this up a little bit and you can see the, the final roughed out piece. So there you go, that's the, now I'm going to take it into a room and coat it with a, uh, uh, a green wood sealer. You can see how beautiful that grain is. So here I am, I'm going to mop on. Uh, this is a green wood sealer, I called it, but it's actually uh, a white glue and it works great for sealing these and keeping the moisture in so the moisture doesn't leave too quickly because if the moisture leaves too quickly it'll crack 
So there you go. That's the rough version. Now let's let's let these pieces dry. And now I'm going to take a diameter here. I'm going to measurement of my chuck, my chuck close. Now you're going to be able to chuck it. Now this piece is dry, by the way. I, I failed to mention this piece is uh, bone dry. Uh, so it's been a, a couple hundred days, maybe. Um, so now I'm ready to make the finished product. Tail stalks up, uh, safety goggles, the whole works. Uh, nice, fresh, sharp gouge. Kind of show you uh, uh, how I hold the tool. I'm left-handed, by the way, as you can tell, the left hand is on the handle. Now I'm going to clean up all the warped parts. This is, a, this is a scraping technique that I scrape with a gouge a lot, so I kind of peel at the wood. It's really efficient. However, it doesn't always leave the best surface. Uh, if it doesn't leave a good surface, I go to a different technique. That's been part of my success as a wood turner by peeling the wood instead of cutting the wood. I do cut the wood when I need to, but I peel at it most of the time, like a peeling an orange in a sense. So I flatten this area. This area has to be flat or a little bit concave. And I'll show you here, I'm gonna put a straight edge to it. <clears throat> There's a straight edge. I wanna make sure that's flat. Now, this is my chucking device. That's the diameter of my chuck right there. <clears throat> I'm gonna carve in a little recess. This is a quarter inch spindle gouge. Now I'm gonna put a little dovetail right back in there. And that's how my chuck is going to grip. And this is only about an eighth of an inch deep. It's very minor. And if I do this properly, it'll, this chucking technique will look like a detail. So the general public will never know how this was held. And that's a good thing. You don't really want to show uh, tool marks or anything like that on your work. So the recess is done. Now I'm developing the base. As I mentioned, platters need at least a 50% base. This is 16 inches in diameter, so an eight inch base <clears throat> will be sufficient. I'm detailing the base, kind of showing you where it is. Now I'm in a shear scraping mode. I'm leaving the tool at a slight angle. Now there, let's stop that right there. I'm gonna back that up just a little bit. Let me speed that through. Um, so when you make a platter, you don't want to get overly designed um, because you think about this, this is a two inch tall object and most folks will never view the side of it because you're going to be looking down on it. So the most beautiful grain, of course, has to be uh, where you're looking at it. Don't get, get carried away with the shape of it so much. Um, and that's where I'm going to, I'm going to show you the total profile here. That's it, a very simple uh, cove going into a bead and then my base. And then my recess is here and that's where I'm chucking it. And then the, uh, the, the platter will come around like this. I'll put a little detail here to uh, kind of show off the rim. Oh, come back. And then I will follow through with a nice smooth curve on the inside, uh, not overly, since the wood is fairly pretty with that medullary ray and the flecking, I keep the design very simple. And again, the base diameter is 50% of the total diameter of the work. So back to it. I don't see any questions here. I'm just keep on going. <clears throat> So now I'm just, I'm taking my gouge here and just kind of sprucing up all the details, making sure those are cut clean and crisp because I don't want to do any uh, sanding next to those areas because it will uh, kind of muddy up the surface. So I like to keep everything relatively sharp. And what I mean by sharp, not sharpness that will cut you, but clean. So here I am power sanding. The exterior, I'll go from 120 grit all the way to 400 grit. Uh, I'll speed this up because nobody wants to see me sand. That's a three inch disc. 
Um, and then I hand sand the details everywhere the disc can't get to uh, with each grit, between each grit. And I also do it forward, reverse, forward, reverse uh, to get the best, best finish. Now here I am, this is a 400 grit. So I've gone through the whole process. And now I'm, I've got 400 grit and I'm gonna clean that up, clean up the whole surface. And then I'm gonna go back over the 400 and burnish it. I'm gonna crush that 400, worn out 400 into the wood and create a kind of a gloss just from the burnishing. And that's important because the finish that this gets is not going to be a shiny finish. I'm gonna, let's see if we can stop right here. Um, let, I'll speed up just a little bit here. You can see a little bit of shine on the wood there. And that shine is caused by my sanding process and not the finishing process. You would never want this item to be used or th this item to have a shiny finish on it if it's going to be used because that shine will go away quickly. So by sanding it to a shine, that's the best I'm ever going to do. I don't want the finish to overshine that surface because I don't want to disappoint the user. So I keep an oil finish on, on this particular piece. Um, and therefore, uh, it, it looks the same today as it will 25 years from now. Although 25 years from now, it might have some cut marks and some stains and things like that. But that's just patina. That's the beauty of the item being used over time. So now I'm going to chuck up into that recess. And notice what I do here, the chuck barely opens. And that's just because I cut it at the exact diameter of the chuck close. Therefore, I don't mar the surface. Now here I am, I'm going to use the tail stock, of course, because I don't have a lot holding that piece on. Now I'm going to address the rim. You wanna get the outer surfaces first and not remove any of the inner wood because that will weaken the ability to cut out here. So there we go. The rim here is going to be roughly, I'm going to say 10 to 12% of the total diameter. You can, you can play with that uh, dimension, uh, make it bigger or smaller. I, making it small is never a good idea. It makes your work kind of look thin. Um, so the rim design is important. <clears throat> and I see, I see platters without rim designs at all, and I don't think they're that attractive. And that, this is the area I'm talking about right here. Right there, that's the detail. I'm gonna leave that detail as we uh, go along here. I'll clean it up with some nice clean cuts. And also this surface is convex. It's not flat. I always leave that convex. I don't have any flat surfaces on my work. Even, the, even this outer rim here is not flat. This area here is not flat. This area is con convex. Then I'm just cleaning up the detail with a quarter inch spindle gouge. Now I'm going to dive in to do the interior dished part. This is an end grain fiber cut, so it uh, uh, causes a lot of heat and friction. Now this, you can see I'm using an awfully large gouge here and the, uh, it's not leaving a nice clean surface and that's not meant to be because this big gouge does not do easy or smooth cutting. It's just a bulk remover. To get a cleaner cut, I'm gonna go to a smaller gouge. So I'll stop right here and then go to that smaller gouge because again, you don't wanna remove that inner surface um, it would make the, the whole piece flex too much. So I leave it fairly bulky there. <clears throat> now 
There we go. Now we'll go to the finish cut. This is cut. This cut looks fairly simple to do, but it's not. It's uh, you're on the top of that detail there. It's real easy to have the tool um, kind of shoot to the left, and that's caught. It's caused by uh, you're basically making a thread, and every wood turner knows that experience uh, to make good tool work, and all of a sudden get a cache, and that that's a spot where you get a cache. Easy to uh, help um, uh, to fix, but it's. Uh, it takes some concentration. So that surface there, I determine if it's done, I leave it. Then I proceed deeper into the platter. Again, you can see those beautiful medullary rays. Now, I'm going to remove all the bulk. And notice I'm going towards the uh, spindle. I never make cuts in that direction because that's all ingrained fiber. I see a lot of wood turners, especially on YouTube, cutting into that, and it's, it's, it's unnecessary and really not appropriate. Again, you can see me scraping with a gouge. And now I'm going to knock that all the way off, and then I'm going to take a, a round nose scraper and make a nice smooth interior. I really want this surface to be nice and clean. I don't want any undulations or anything. It has to be smooth because light will catch it, and it'll show bad tool work. So that's basically it. And then, of course, I'm going to go through the sanding process um, and all that. So there's our finished platter, un unsanded. Let's get to the sanding again. I'm sanding there with a the lathe off right there at the dead center because you don't want to cut a groove into that when it's on. So notice as I sand here, my sander only gets to the center and then moves on quickly because I don't want to dig a hole there because I'm sanding the same area over and over. Uh, whereas out here, I can stay out here and never hit the same surface twice uh, for a while. It has to come back onto itself. So let me speed through this again. Clean it all off. There's our finished piece. Uh, great family heirloom, uh, good to have around the house. Now I'm gonna burn my name into it. And I apologize here, um, I'm gonna, it may, it's gonna look like an advertisement that I didn't mean it to be. Um, I'm gonna coat this with walnut oil. Now walnut oil, this particular walnut oil, uh, walnut oil is a great finish for utility work um, because it's a drying oil. And it's not an evaporative oil like mineral oil. Um, so one heavy coat like this, and it's it's pretty much permanent. It's always going to be in the wood. Um, you can see it darkens it up a little bit, highlights the medullary ray. Uh, it's just, just beautiful. And again, this is a finish that goes into the wood, and it's not on the exterior like a film finish. So it's, it's more apt for um, uh, use for um, utility. So utility items probably should never have film finishes. And having said that, there's plenty of products out there that you can buy and they, they might even say salad bowl finish. Uh, but if they create a film, it's probably not a good idea uh, because uh, the ability for them to break down over time. And us craftspeople, um, uh, you've got to know that many times putting a finish on anything is, is a very skillful operation. Um, putting a film finish on an item is a very skillful operation. And if you sell your work to other people or give it away, of course, and they break down that film, those folks that you gave that piece to probably don't have the skill to repair that finish. 
So better not give them that type of finish. <clears throat> so give them a, a penetrating oil because everybody's kids and grandparents can apply a walnut oil style finish or a mineral oil finish. Well, that's pretty much my presentation. Um, I'm looking for some questions. I'm gonna see if I can scroll down here and find some. And I, I don't see any, I think I'm in the wrong window. And I apologize for not um, having the ability to see messages. I'm gonna look on YouTube here with my other device here and see uh, if there's anything I need to see here. And that'll probably cause a feedback issue. Um, but anyway, well, that, like I said, that's my presentation and uh, I'm honored to be uh, asked here to, to give a presentation today. Um, thanks so much and I'll, I'll stay around for a few minutes in case some question pops up. Thank you very much.